All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Rapid Fire at Macworld. Thank you for your patience. If you're not familiar with Rapid Fire, the basic idea is pretty simple. We're going to have a series of presenters who are going to come up and do their darndest to teach you something in five minutes. We're pretty strict about that five minutes. We've got a clock running here. It will start when the presenters begin talking. And I will cut them off when five minutes is hit. Um, that's pretty much it. And feel free to applaud afterwards as we transition to the next speaker. So without further ado, first up is Bill Wicking is going to show us how to fly with your mind. Hi, folks. Welcome. Um, I'm uh, Bill Wicking, and I'm, I'm here with a group of students from Hawaii. So uh, this is our first time uh, to present on this side of the stage. Uh, we're going to be doing another presentation to, on Saturday with uh, many more things. Uh, and I wonder if I stop talking if you stop the clock. I'm really excited about seeing Chris Breen do Louie Louie. That's really why I'm up here. So I get a back, back view at that. Um, Duncan, can you show the, uh, the helicopter? This is a drone. You may have seen these before. And what you might be able to see on one of the screens is what you look like. So he's going to fly this around. Uh, this has been out for a few years. We actually found this at Macworld. Careful there. Um, it's made out of styrofoam, so it won't hurt you. But what we've done is we, we first tried this to take pictures of aerial things uh, in a farm system where we are. So uh, we do a lot of uh, projects with that. Can you see me OK? Hi, guys. So where we took this is uh, the next page. So what we did is we, we saw this drone and we said, this is really, really neat. We'd like to be able to fly it with uh, an iPad, which is it, what it does. The next step of this is inertial navigation. You can actually move the iPad around. Many of you guys have seen this before. And we decided to take it to the next level. We actually hacked the first few versions of this and made it so we could have ranges of up to miles away by using big antennas. That's a whole other story if you're interested. But the real place I wanted to take this is we, we got this emotive headset. So you see my student over here, Duncan, is wearing an elaborate hairnet which is actually reading his brain waves. And this is what his brain waves look like, like that. Not right now because we uh, couldn't get it working. The Bluetooth is getting a lot of interference. I'm sure he still has brain waves, but uh, this is what his brain waves would look like. And we've actually got this, Duncan's got this, so that he can actually fly the quad rotor with his brain, uh, which is pretty darn cool. So uh, what you're seeing right now, I'm glad he's doing it with the iPad instead of his brain because if he thought of something else, he might take it in a certain direction. The real reason we got this headset that he's wearing right over there, first of all, was to control a, an automated building. Then the students decided they wanted to find out what kind of teacher I am, so they wore the headset and, and it can actually tell if you're bored or engaged. So I taught in different methods and they could tell when I was striking out, which was enlightening. And then they, we decided to actually find out if iBooks are more engaging than normal textbooks. So we did an experiment for an entire year last year with the headset. All the time, Duncan was uh, experimenting with this and learning how to actually control this with his, his mind. So uh, one of the interesting things about this is that when you train the helicopter, you have to think of a certain thing. So there's a training regimen, and you get an identity. And you train this with an orange box that moves back and forth. One of the things that Duncan actually discovered was that if you are uh, listening to music, for example, it will associate that music with that action. So Duncan was training the helicopter to do a certain action. Certain music was on in the background. Later on, when he wasn't training the helicopter and that music came on, the helicopter did that action. So you have to be careful what you're thinking about with this. And I know you, you guys all know where this is going, is if we're going to control real things with this, we have to have really good discipline. Um, so the next step is that that's what the brain looks like. And this is what the simulator looks like. So we would normally have this live, and on Saturday we will have this live. But uh, when Duncan flies it with his mind, you'll actually see the simulator move around. And if the helicopter is live, you'll actually see the helicopter move. And um, that's uh, where we're going to go with this, literally. Now, where would this go in the future? Well, we want to extend the range. We want to make it so that we can do this farther and farther away. We want to make it more useful. Um, some of the things that this could be used for is for cinematography. There are a lot of film people here at the conference this, uh, this year. And you can imagine that instead of having a helicopter with a camera on it flying around taking movies of New Zealand for Hobbit movies, you could actually have one of these quad rotors for this. The next version of this is, actually has a little bit more automation to it. And that is it has GPS. So you can program these. And there's a whole league of people that have turned these into programmable uh, airbots that they can fly through in their neighborhood and take pictures. So uh, good, bad, or ugly, that's uh, kind of where we're headed with this. 
Um, so that's the quad rotor helicopter and the brainwave headset that he's wearing. I don't know if you can turn around. Do you want to land that and show them what the headset looks like? That would probably be a good thing. Yeah. It also has an interesting feature that when it runs out of batteries, it has a blinking light and it says, I'm landing by emergency, and it goes down. So, uh, Duncan, you want to turn around a little bit? And I don't know if your mic is live there, but you, can you see the headset? Yeah. So this connects by Bluetooth. It has a range of about 60 or 70 feet. One of the things that we did when we were testing um, our education stuff is that we were actually measuring two or three students with the brainwave thing to see if they were engaged or not. And we could actually do differentiated learning and find out if some people were visual learners, some people are auditory learners, and we think this is the next step in education instead of giving people and tests. Bill, I'm going to cut you off at five minutes. Perfect. Thanks. Nice job. I realize I was remiss in not actually identifying myself. I am Macworld Senior Editor Dan Morin. I'm your host for the evening. I thought we should jump right in because I thought that would be a good way of experiencing what Rapid Fire has to offer. So uh, as we get set up here, uh, our next presentation is going to be from Ben Waldy. He's going to show us a little bit about using uh, uh, email product productivity tips. Um, so I'm sure we are all entirely barraged with email these days. Uh, nothing but spam and offers for prescription drugs. Uh, I think we could all use a little bit of help managing that flow of email. I know I have three separate email addresses these days, so I could definitely use the help myself. And I'm hoping Ben's tips here will, will be good for me too. Ben, you all set? Yep. Uh, we got some video on? on this? And slides, okay. All right, so take it away. I'm Ben Waldy, and I'm gonna talk to you about email productivity. So according to about.com, 294 billion emails were sent per day in 2010, and this works out to about 2.8 million emails per second, uh, or 90 trillion emails per year, and that was three years ago. Average email size is about 70K, so if this is accurate, then about 200 gigabytes of emails sent every second, and 90% of all email is spam and viruses. Does your email inbox look like this? Actually, maybe this looks pretty good to you, uh, I needed an example with lots of messages in the inbox, especially unread messages, so I snagged this uh, screenshot last week from my wife's email, and I guess she should have looked at the uh, email proofing email that I sent to her. Um, so anyway, you know it, I know it, everybody knows it, email's a huge problem. Uh, it's overwhelming, and it's stressful, and it's often unmanageable, and it distracts us from the other important things that we have to do. But what can we really do about it? Well, I'm going to just share some quick tips for dealing with email overload. So first of all, your inbox is not a to-do list. So don't keep stuff there until you just get around to working on it. Because in many cases, you never will because your list is just going to keep growing. New stuff will come in and you'll want to focus on that first. So work to get your inbox empty. And without all that stuff staring you in the face, you're going to feel more relaxed and uh, you can get other stuff done. Uh, but how can you possibly get it empty and keep it that way? Well, when you, uh, when you work on email, try to stay focused. So try to minimize distractions and try going into full screen mode maybe to uh, minimize things like Facebook updates that are appearing in the background uh, that are fighting for your attention. And set your iPhone to do not disturb and turn off your notification center alerts or just go offline uh, if you have to so that you can focus on email. Dedicate specific times to email. So maybe from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day, that's when you work on emptying your inbox and then you get stuff done for a few hours, and then maybe later in the day you have some more dedicated email times. And you don't also have to respond immediately to everything. When you reply to your boss, it just encourages her to write back to you. So just buffer your time, um, and maybe you want to hold that email for a little while before you actually send it. You could write the email and just not send it right away. So here's how you can get through your inbox. First, get rid of any of the junk and stuff that doesn't require a response. Next. Deal with anything that takes only a minute or two to respond. And then finally work on the more complex stuff. And one way you can deal with this is separate it into buckets, maybe personal and business, and then just pick one to work on and process in order of receipt and importance. If you can't reply to something right now, that doesn't mean you can't get out of your inbox either. So consider creating holding areas for messages that need attention. And then you can move stuff there and process it later. And then for important stuff, you can flag it or something like that so that you can find it more easily. Don't waste time fi filing tons and tons of messages. Uh, you, 
You might create mailboxes for some things, but you don't have to do that for everything. For everything else, just create one archive mailbox and dump everything there. And then when you need to find it, just use Spotlight to search for it. Uh, and you can use the AND or the OR in all caps wildcards to narrow down your search results. To help file messages faster in mail, you can create favorite mailboxes by dragging them up to the favorites bar. Um, and then you can switch to those mailboxes just by clicking on them or pressing command and the favorite number. So here, command two. Uh, you can also file messages there, like selected messages, by just selecting messages and dragging them up to that mailbox favorite. Or you can push uh, command control and the favorite number to send them right there. So that can help you with filing messages faster. Um, if you find yourself searching for the same stuff over and over again, then think about creating some smart mailboxes. Uh, you might create one to display all your unread messages. Or uh, there, you can actually set it to look for attachments matching a certain name. Uh, so you could do something like that as well. Whenever I write something, I try to think about whether I can use that again. Uh, and this happens to me a lot in email. So when, it, when I think I can use it again, I archive it as a snippet in something like Text Expander, and then I won't have to type it again the next time. With Text Expander, I just assign abbreviations to it, and then I type the abbreviation into the snippet, and, or into my email or whatever, and the snippet pops in. Um, if you want a, short way, a quick way to write less emails, just, or shorter emails, just put your signature as sent from my iPhone. <laughs> um, and finally, if you're not using IMAP, then you really should be using IMAP. Uh, with IMAP, if you delete a message on one device, it deletes everywhere else. Um, and people are always coming up to me, how come when I delete this message on my iPhone, I have to go delete it on my Mac too? Get an IMAP account. Um, here's some quick resources in my last 10 seconds. 43folders.com has lots of tips on email productivity. Bit Literacy by Mark Hurst is a good book that helps you get your t inbox zero. And you can also check out uh, Steve Robbins. Zero seconds left. Oh, I lost my mic. There we are. Just, but you got in right under the wire. Thank you. Nice. Stay. Uh, those are some good tips. I'm hoping that I can get rid of the 50,000 messages I have in my inbox. Friends of mine will know that is not a joke. I actually do keep everything in my inbox. <laughs> I'm a terrible human being, but thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. I'm still welcome. <laughs> We're going to stay with mail for a second. Uh, our next speaker is Dave Hamilton, who you may know from the Mac Observer or from his rock and band. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about add-ons to mail that we can use to make ourselves even more productive. Dave, take it away. Thanks. So yeah, we're going to talk about mail add-ons. We're going to try and talk about three in the four minutes and 55 seconds that I have left, plus the 32 you owe me from last year. Uh, we'll start with mail act-on. Ben talked about filing messages, and mail act-on can make that even easier, and I will show you, I think. Are we going here? So you can highlight a message and choose the archive from the message menu, or you can drag the message into your archive folder. But uh, suppose you want to do that even faster, or you're breaking Ben's rules and you have several uh, messages that, or several mailboxes that you want to archive things to. Well, that's where Mail Act On comes in. And it shows up in your preferences, but that's not really uh, the thing you want to look at. You want to look at your rules. And you get these extra rules that you can see up here. And you can create all these rules and you assign a key to them, and I will show you how that works. So we'll click on a rule and we'll click edit. And this will look familiar if you've ever created a mail rule. You give it a name, you assign a key, that's the different part. And then you tell it what you want to happen. Uh, for this one, we're moving the message to the archive folder, or the action folder, because I have an action folder to keep my inbox empty. And then when I hit control A, that message goes away, or control Z files it in my archive. And I'm done. And it's pretty awesome. So that's mail act on. Next up is Signature Profiler. A quick little tip. Um, in mail, you can actually have multiple email addresses attached to one account, and you separate them with commas like I have done here. But you only get one signature per account, and that's where Signature Profiler comes in. So we go to see your signatures. You've got just one attached to each account by default. You can, of course, change them. But I want it to change when I select a different email address. And that's where we use Signature Profiler. You'll see now, I select this and it shows me all these email addresses that I have. And I've got different signatures for each one. I've got different signatures for Mac Observer, for my personal stuff, for Mac Geekab feedback. I've got different stuff there. It auto-fills it. 
and it's pretty cool. You can add iTunes, what song you're listening to, your Skype status, if any of that matters to you. Uh, I'll show you it in action. Watch as I change email addresses here, the signature changes. I'm going to change to the Mac Geek Cab feedback here, and you'll see it changes all from one IMAP account. Pretty cool, that signature profiler. Last but not least, perhaps my favorite, Docstar. Docstar, um, well, I'll show you. You know, mail, we are able to put one thing as a badge on our doc icon. And, uh, and we get to pick that from inbox, all mailboxes, or one of our smart mailboxes. That's not enough even if we only had one badge. What if we wanted to have many badges because we have some mailboxes we care about. We've created some filters and we want to see what's in those filters. Well, that is what Docstar is for. And so we will go and see Docstar. And now you'll see. And that's what your mail icon can look like. And you set up up to five. You don't have to use all five, but you can set up up to five. And, uh, you know, instead of just the inbox, I want only one of my inboxes to show up as the first one. So I can set that. And I can change the size, as you see. Uh, I can now go to badge two. And maybe I want that to be my second inbox. Maybe I have a work and a personal inbox, and I don't need them. I don't want to see them both the same. I can change the color. Uh, as I said, we can change the size. We'll go to mail three. Maybe I'll put that for my Macworld Expo PR stuff so that I see when there's stuff coming in. I can show it in the menu bar. And what's cool in the menu bar is I can click and it brings me to that mailbox directly. So very, very handy stuff. And, uh, and that's Docstar. And you can actually see Docstar. Well, you can see the guys who made Docstar downstairs. They're over in uh, what I like to call Shantytown. Um, but they're, they're off to the side there. It's Ecamm Networks, and that's, uh, that's Docstar. So, Dan, I think you're going to owe me yet another 32 seconds because the links are up. So, Mail Act on Signature Profiler and Docstar. And you came in under time. Well done, Dave. <laughs> well, that's plenty of ways to deal with my email, or plenty of more ways to ignore my email, if that's the way I want to go. Uh, next up, we're going to change gears a little bit. My friend and colleague, Chris Breen, is going to show us how we can use our iPad to play a classic tune to which nobody actually knows the lyrics. Right. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that we're getting video out from this thing. We are. OK, excellent. So this is a, oh, you want to see if it makes sound. Uh, it's, it's flipped. It's upside down. Oh, it's upside down? OK. So, OK. Does this count against my No, we're not. We're no, not counting. Okay. We'll reset the clock for you. And then you want to lock it? No, I don't need a lock it. I just need it. Is it still going to be upside down? I just want to do it. Do you see it? There we go. Oh, it's still it's upside, upside down. down. See, it's upside down here. Go. There we go. There we go. I was, I was going to be even more impressed, Chris, if you could do it upside down. Well, I, if I were in Australia, I, I know you're I a would. talented musician, but that, that seems like a bit much even for you. Okay, I have to do, also do an audio test, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to find out if, sure it's if it's going to make the sound that I want it to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fine. This is not supposed to be this hard. There. Nope, we need some audio over here. Make sure it's turned up. Can we get some audio assistance? I lost my audio guy. Uh, still waiting for audio. Because GarageBand without audio... It's definitely less fun. Is it... A little more? Oh, a little more volume. That sounds good. Okay. Good. Um, hang on. And... Yeah. All right. Chris, okay. take it away. <clears throat> I'm going to show you how to play a, uh, one of the uh, classic songs of all time. This was written by Ludwig van Beethoven in, the, uh, in 1804. It was originally called Ludwig, Ludwig, but now it is called Louis Louis. So I am in GarageBand on my iPad. I'm going to touch the plus button. I'm going to create a new song. I can tap any instrument I care to. What I really want to get to is the tracks editor, which I've just tapped here. Up comes my track editor. I'm going to tap on loops. And I want to grab the bar band basic drum set number two. And we'll play that to hear it. 
That is the perfect Louie Louie beat. Now I need to add another instrument. And we are going to add the smart keyboard. Tap on grand piano because I don't want that sound. I want the classic rock organ. That's all you need to know to play Louie Louie, C, F, and G. And so we tap it backwards. It's going to give us four measures, or four beats to start. Tap on record. Okay, awesome. If you want to sing along at any point, <laughs> even though nobody knows the lyrics to this particular song. Okay, so now we have the keyboard part. Tap on instruments again to create yet another instrument track, and this time I am going to go to the bass guitar. And it's here somewhere. Here's the bass guitar. Smart bass. See how smart it really is? Go. This time you actually have to tap on strings. So, C, F, G. Back it up, count four. So, you know, Beethoven knew would, he had the perfect lick, and he just didn't want to give up on that. So we're going to go back to instruments again, because there's still more that you can do. And so, we need the guitar part, because that's what you do. And we've got our smart guitar. We don't want an acoustic guitar, because... No, that's not a Louis Louis kind of sound. Instead, you want your roots rock sound. Right? And you want an overdrive. And once again, so we're going to go C... And here we go again. Okay, so what have we got? Let's take a look at our tracks editor. We've got four tracks, which is all you need for Louie Louie. More than that is showing off. So, we're going to go to the tools menu, and I want to turn off the metronome, which is that obnoxious clicking sound, because we have a drummer now. And let's see how it sounds. Okay, as always, the guitar player is too loud. Just, it's the way it works, it's their nature. So if you slide across, you can get to a track mixer. And I'll go back up, and now I can change the volume of the guitar. You know, really, it's better without them all together. But you can give them a little bit. You want to sing along here? Uh, ooh, and up too high. Too high, we got to do something about that. OK, so we're going to back up. Go back to our tools and, oh, we're in the key of C. Okay, let's change that so that we're in the key of F. And we'll play it. Not bad. One other thing, uh, the uh, guitar player is playing out of time as they do. And so what we will do is we're going to quantize their track. But uh, no, we're not because it's actually perfect. I'm going to go over here. And uh, quantization, which means it's going to lock it in. So I'm going to lock that to a 16th note. And you too can play Louie Louie on your iPad. And I'm done. I can't even play Louie Louie on anything that's you know, not even digital. So that was a great, I, I think that's something that we can all use in our everyday life, really, is the ability to play Louie Louie. Um, next up, we've got the fine gentleman from iFixit. If you've ever broken any of your iOS or Macs, uh, any of your iOS devices or Macs, then you've probably ended up with these guys in a Google search. <laughs> they are the guys who know how to fix everything, and they're going to show us a few things that you can fix yourself 
in just five minutes. Kyle Weens, Scott Head, take it away. Thank you. Uh, so we've got five minutes. I'm going to show you five things you can fix in five minutes, and I have Scott here to help me out. Scott is actually going to fix two things in five minutes, and because that's not enough of a challenge for Scott, he's going to do it blindfolded. <laughs> so Scott is going to first fix broken back glass in the iPhone. Who has seen somebody break the glass in an iPhone? This is a fairly common thing. Okay, that's like most of the people in the room. It's not very hard. There are two screws on the bottom. They're pentalobe screws, so you need a special screwdriver. We sell that screwdriver. Once you get the screwdriver, once you get the screws off, you just slide the back panel off. So Scott is, is removing the screws now. Once you're in, this is it. This is the iPhone. So you've got the battery is, is most of the, the internals. If you're going to replace the back glass, you just put the new glass on and you're done. This is a repair anybody can do in under two minutes with no experience required. Now, for repair number two, we're going to replace the battery. You can get a new battery for 20 bucks, and it's very straightforward to do. Now, iPhone batteries and most lithium-ion batteries only last about 300 charges. So that's a full charge discharge. If you go through your phone's battery every single day, you're going to be burning through a battery about once a year. My iPhone 4S died in August. Uh, it wouldn't turn on anymore, even connected to power. It was only 11 months old. I burned through my battery. It was done. I needed a new battery. Apple doesn't make it very easy for you to do this sort of thing. So we step up. All of these instructions are online for free because we want to teach people how to do it. So battery connector right here, removing that uh, as Scott is chugging away on this iPhone. The battery is glued in with just a tiny amount of adhesive. So you need to get in with a pry tool, pry the adhesive up. And then one thing you'll notice is that sticker. I like stickers that say things like that. So that sticker says authorized service personnel only. That means you. You are now authorized by me to be an official Apple repair tech. So Scott's got the back panel off, and he's having trouble finding his tools blindfolded, but there we go. All right, so he's prying the battery out. Uh, I'm just going to show you the rest of this. Once you get the battery out, you just put the whole thing back together, you're done. This repair is very straightforward. It's absolutely crazy to pay somebody else to replace an iPhone battery for you. You can do it. It's not hard at all. Okay, repair number three, putting a new battery in a MacBook Pro or MacBook Air, it's basically the same process. There are 12 screws on the bottom. On the MacBook Air, they are pentalobe screws. On the MacBook Pro, they are Phillips number 00 screws. Very easy to get these screwdrivers. Take the screws out, you can lift it up with a fingernail, and then you're at the battery. There's one connector, and then there's a few screws on the battery. These are Phillips number 00 screws on the battery. Once you do that, you can pull the battery out, put the new battery in. It's not as easy as it used to be, but it is possible. Now, I say MacBook Pro. What I mean by MacBook Pro is anything but the Retina MacBook Pro, where it's not possible to do this. The whole product is glued together, and when the battery is done, the computer is done. Okay, repair number four, iMac Glass. Any of you have overactive kittens or children? <laughs> Maybe knock the iMac on onto its side. The glass breaks relatively easily, but the LCD is usually fine, so it's crazy to throw away an iMac because you've got broken glass. Apple has an ingenious mechanism. There are magnets baked into the, the case of the computer and then metal on the glass, and you actually use suction cups to lift the glass up, pull it out a little bit, and then the glass comes right off. Again, this is a repair that you can do in under five minutes yourself. Save yourself a lot of money. Okay, last repair. Let's say that you want to replace the battery in your iPad in under five minutes. There's only one real technique that I can recommend to do that, and it involves a new tool that we call the FUBAR. This is it. This is the process for using the FUBAR. And I'm going to warn you, we, we took this photo outside because this is the general recommended procedure, because when you use the FUBAR to remove the battery from the iPad, there tends to be flying projectiles that result. This is what happened to our iPad after we used the FUBAR. But let me tell you, after we're done with this, the battery comes out just fine. <laughs> okay, Scott, let's give him a round of applause. So Scott's got his phone. So two repairs completed there. He installed a new battery, and he was able to install new glass. Now, let's say that you've got an iPad, and you're saying, well, gee, I don't really want a FUBAR in my iPad. I'd really like to fix it myself. Well, bad news, it cannot be done in five minutes. But you can fix your iPad yourself. Uh, this is a tool that we developed. I know it doesn't look like a tool. It's actually a sack full of a material that heats up. And so you stick the, 
the sack in a microwave, you heat it up and you use it to melt the adhesive on the edge of the iPad. You pry up the adhesive loops, you use suction cups of your fingers to get the glass out, and then you can get into the iPad. So that's five repairs in five minutes. Thank you very much. Check out iFixit.com. Spot on timing. Nice job, gentlemen. Well, I, um, I hope, do you guys do uh, uh, like, like kitchen appliances? Like if I break my refrigerator, can you tell me how to fix that in five minutes? That would be, see, that's, these guys know everything. If you have, oh, the blender, yeah. So basically, ifixit.com anytime you break anything, including hearts. <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming up, guys. You know, be ready for this. All right, so next up, we're going to have a presentation here from Christian Boyce. Just a minute. He's going to get you guys get some mirroring on, so we're, we're doing some, some video. Um, I can't he's going to show us how to do things more, better, faster, and funner. I'm pretty sure that's a word. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that I'm Apple like, used that in, a, in an ad once, so, so I can see what I'm doing. as far as I'm concerned, right. that seems pretty legit want? to me. There. How are we doing so far, guys? We're hitting the targets. We'll make five minutes. Are we enjoying? Are we enjoying ourselves? Are we entertained? Yeah. That's you. mainly what I'm concerned yes. about. I'm just here to entertain you and figure out ways to talk while we're doing this. All right, Are we ready? all set? Let's do it. All right, Christian, take all it right, away. So, hi, I'm Christian Boyce, and I'm going to show you three add-on programs that will make everything you do with your Mac more efficient, give you better results, uh, faster than ever before, and you'll have a whole lot more fun doing it. So you don't have to take notes or anything because I put everything on a handout that's on my website, and there it is, christianboyce.com. Okay. So each of these things I'm going to show you is going to solve a little problem. And our first little problem is that the green zoom button in, um, in every window doesn't ever do what I want it to do. I click this button, and it just does something. And if I want to go full screen, I've got to move it over here, and I've got to then I stretch it out again. And if I want to go half a screen, there's no way to do it. So we need something that's going to help us uh, do that. And the thing that does that is called Moom. And it's called Moom because it moves and it zooms. So here we go. Here's, here's Moom. I turn Moom on. And now, if I hover over my little uh, zoom button, I get extra stuff. And so this button, I slide down and that goes full. If I go here, it goes half. OK, I go here, it's the other half. You getting it? OK, so now, suppose what I want to do is do a little bit less than uh, full, but a little bit more than half. I can draw a box and say I want it to go like that. Then I can bring my reminders up here. Maybe I want my reminders to take up the other space. So now, nice and neat, everything's just perfect the way I want. That's Moom. Go get it. Free, uh, free trial. My next problem is that my desktop's a mess because I put everything on it, and I can't focus on what I'm working on. And so you're probably thinking, well, just do hide others. And so here's a calculator. I want to do some things. I go up here to do hide others. And that's great, except for then I've got this crazy desktop with all my icons, OK? So I need to hide that too, OK? I need to hide that too. So the way we hide it is with something called desktop curtain. Desktop curtain throws a curtain down on top of everything. And so now, when I look at the calculator, it's just the calculator and this curtain. Of course, if I do something else, like text edit, it's just this app. And there's settings so you can control how this all works. And some of the neat settings are you can change the color. If you don't like red curtains, you can make blue curtains. If you don't like blue curtains, you can just like blue. If you don't like just blue, you can put up some other picture. And I've got one. And oh, look, here's one. So now I've got a, uh, <laughs> now I've got my own little backdrop. And my icons are still back there. I can get them again because. I can set a toggle, I'm going to say control tab to toggle the curtain. So here, I'm looking at the calculator, I hit control tab, and there's my icons again. I'm seeing more stuff again. So that's desktop curtain. Go get that too. Our final program solves the problem of I have too much to type, and I'm not that good a typist. So there's a lot of words that are kind of weird in the Mac world that you type a lot, like iPhone and iPad and iPhoto and I, 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 with these extra crazy capital letters. Well, if I do, if I type iPad, and if I make it big enough for you to see, there, you can see. If I do iPhone, they just sit there. It's a drag. So I want that fixed. And that's when I use this thing called Typeinator. So the Typeinator will expand what I type and convert it to what I want. 
So you don't need to know how it works, uh, you just need to know that it does work. So look, iPhone, iPad, uh, iTunes, everything's just fixed for me. How about a little shortcut for my email address? It's too long. Next time I'll have a shorter name. But look, I can do CBEM for email. There's my whole email. All right, now I can do some other things. I'm tired of typing Macworld slash iWorld. It's driving me nuts. So I can go to Typenator and I'm going to define a new shortcut here. So I'm going to say I want to go MWIW and have that say Macworld slash iWorld. So now if I do MWIW, it's just there. And no, it's not just there in, in text edit, it's there in mail. So here's a mail program. M, I'll say I am at MWIW. And there it is. So you want this too. Now you can do other things that are more impressive. So people ask me questions a lot. I want to give them answers and I want to give them good answers. So I've canned some of them, like set default printer. Here's how you set the default printer. And look, it's pretty with color and with italics and all kinds of stuff. And if I write an Apple script, if I was a good Apple scripter, I would put a title block at the beginning, but it takes too much time. So now I type the word title block and it gives me all that stuff. So now I can be neat and better. All right, so that's about it. I just want to show you one more that I did and it goes like this. Thank you for coming. All right. All right. Well done. All right, thank you, Christian. Those are some handy tips. We have one more presenter for you. Uh, Dr. Stephen LeBeouf is going to show us a little bit about fitness. Uh, and I'm sure it's, it's January, so we're all still coming to grips with the fact that we're probably not going to keep our New Year's resolution. I was supposed to be going to the gym all show, basically, in order to actually be in shape. That didn't work out for me. Um, but he's going to show us a little bit about using technology to uh, help us take our fitness to the next level using, apparently, an iPad mini. I'm fascinated. I would like to know. So Taylor, gonna, I think we're going to have it up here, and let's do it. All right. So, uh, oh. so uh, my name is Stephen LaBeouf, and I am uh, the co-founder and CEO of Valencell. Uh, Valencell is the inventor of PerformTech Precision Biometrics, and it's a technology that goes inside your audio earbuds, like the one I'm wearing now. And so while you're listening to music or talking on the phone, whatever you're doing with your headset, it measures your health and fitness metrics, sends it to the phone, and also then uh, in the cloud does analytics to help train and coach you to better health, fitness, and performance. And we actually came up with this idea back in 2006 when we realized we saw all these people running and uh, wearing headphones. And we exercise, so we don't dig the chest strap and all that other stuff. We said, you know, where can we find one spot where we can measure everything that's important with something we already wear? And uh, this, this, this particular Bluetooth headset here that I'm wearing right now is uh, medallion style. So it's a stereo headphone. I'm, you only need one bud for it to work, though. And it's Bluetooth from my little medallion here where I control my volume to this iPad mini. So this, this little app here, um, you can pick your playlist, you know, what kind of stuff you want to listen to. Um, also, if you want vocal feedback, we got a girl on here who tells you if you're in the right zones and stuff and gives you audio feedback, though I don't think you're going to be able to hear it on here uh, unless this outputs uh, audio. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a run here. So one of the thing, first things that's going to happen, it's going to start sensing my blood to make sure that I have any signal at all. At the bottom of the device here, I can control my music. Now, I don't know. Yeah, I hear it on here, but you can't hear it on there. Um, so oh, can you hear that right now? No. So it's not, it's not playing the volume for you. Let me um, go ahead and check out something here. It's uh, called PerformTech, Precision Biometrics. Now, I, I don't know, does anyone know if this thing will play volume out from being plugged in the, in the, through the uh, speaker here? I think you need a, an audio cable, which we had. Okay, that, that'll plug in here, okay. All right. That sounds like audio. Yes. All right. So. All right. So, oh, 
Damn gravity. All right, so I believe that this will play some sound now. Let me get some there. Well, you, you don't hear it, do you? So I guess we'll just go to the sensing part. So this, at the bottom here, it's, it's sensing my calories burn. Um, it's actually doing it through the earbud. It's measuring my blood flow. Uh, at the bottom right there is the total calories I've burned since I've started, actually, the app. At the top is my heart rate, and you can actually see it streamed out in real time at the same time. Um, also, you can see my pace, cadence, uh, distance, speed. Uh, if I were moving around here, this would be incrementing. There's a little delay here on it, but be moving around here. You'll see my step rate increment. And so I actually train with this device. Uh, I use it for my, uh, my workout epochs. I actually do heart rate training. And so I'll go ahead and I'll stop this and show you that you can... With, with this app, you can actually do tests. For example, you can take a, a VO2 max test, and she tells you what to do. Uh, she says, walk a mile as fast as you can, don't run. And when you're done, she actually gives you a fitness assessment. Um, also, uh, you can look at your, your uh, workouts here. This is one of my workouts I did. Uh, you could see the distance I ran, uh, the average heart rate I had. You can plot out your heart rate. Uh, this particular case, I was actually doing um, some uh, heart rate training. And, and this is how we do the analysis. You see, we, we measure the cadence and we overlay that with the heart rate and we see how your heart responds actually to the exercise. So for example, we get these little reports out. And let's see if I could show this on the screen well. So this is a training that actually I was doing with the device and it was actually, uh, uh, in this particular case, I was doing six, um, six different um, heart rate epochs. And at the end, it does a recovery time analysis. And from August 9th to September 25th, you can see how I improved my uh, heart rate. Actually, my heart got stronger. So for the same workout, it was beat, having to beat less. Uh, also, you know, it also measures your respiration rate. And we can actually see that my, the amount of breathing I had to do to work out as hard also went down. Uh, also, you can actually see from everyone else in the database how you compare to others uh, with this, this app. And so we license the technology out. Uh, iRiver actually has a product entering the marketplace in March. It's called the iRiver On. It's our first licensee. And so when you see these products in the marketplace, you'll be able to uh, listen to music, talk on the phone, uh, go for a run, whatever it is you do with headphones, but at the same time, uh, get the information you need to be trained uh, and coached towards better fitness and health. Thanks for your time. And sorry about the delays. It's, it's called, it's called, uh, it's called PerformTech. It doesn't hit the market until March. And the app, the app is called the iRiver On, um, iRiver Space On. If you look online, you can see uh, the iRiver On product. I'm not aware that iRiver On's app, their version of this, is actually on the, the, the uh, iStore right now. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, by now you should be in better shape, you should have a cleaner inbox, you should be using your Mac more efficiently, and you can pretty much fix anything that breaks in your entire house. Uh, I hope we've packed full your hour and informed you of some things to entertain you with some others. Uh, I'd like to think, give a warm round of applause to all of our presenters who did a great job. Thanks very much for coming out, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show.